not much improvement, but I'm back. <laughs> I wasn't, I didn't style my hair this morning. I wasn't expecting to be more public than the noon Zoom. <laughs> but Hello, I'm everyone. Be on for a few seconds, so. a minute maybe. Hello, everyone, and welcome. We'll get started here in just a moment as everyone enters. My name is Jill Annable, Senior Vice President of Programs here at NCEA. We are so glad to have you with us today in this webinar, The State of Catholic Education. We are going to look at this school year's national enrollment data. Um, we are also available for any Q&A you may have. So as things come to mind, please enter those into the Q&A box that you see available on your screen. Before we begin, um, we are, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Sister Dale McDonald. Sister Dale McDonald is the Vice President of Public Policy. She is also a sister of the Presentation of the Blessed Virgin Mary. She has held various roles in Catholic education. She served on various boards of trustees for educational and social service organizations. She has been published in education journals and books. She served on several committees convened by the White House, the U.S. Department of Education, and the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops. She's earned her PhD in Educational Administration from Boston College, and she's also been the mind behind this enrollment data for a very long time. Um, so, Sister Dale, if you could please um, uh, begin in prayer, and then we're going to turn it over to our other colleagues um, in just a few minutes. Thank you. So let us ask the Lord's blessing on what we're about to do. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good and gracious God, we thank you for the gift of this day and the opportunity to gather in your name. Bless us as we share the current news of the state of Catholic education. And continue your guidance and blessing on all who minister in our schools, administrators, teachers, and staff as well as students and their parents and guardians, and all those whose generous support sustains this vital ministry of your church. Be with us, Lord, during this hour. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Well, let me offer my welcome to all of you. Um, we're pleased to share with you now the latest results from our national survey on schools enrollment and staffing. And during this past year, we've made a major transition. After almost 25 years of producing this report, I am now focusing solely on public policy issues. And I've worked during the past year with Annie Smith, the NCEA Vice President of Research and Data, who will now be producing the survey with its report. In addition to all the other research and analysis she's charged with doing on behalf of NCEA to help in our strategic planning and problem solving and other uses of data that will be important for our NCEA as well as for you. So this work that she will be doing expands upon her work as a former associate superintendent of strategy, research and data for the Archdiocese of Boston Catholic Schools Office. And she is assisted with, by Sarah Huber, who is the data manager who provides analysis and quality assurance of the data reports and produces solutions as well as engaging in survey design and distribution. So NCEA is very pleased and fortunate to have these two very capable professionals who will expand our data production capabilities and be able to help us uh, further assist schools with their need for data. So without further ado, Annie, tell us about the state of Catholic education. Thank you so much, Sister Dale, for such a lovely introduction. Um, I'm gonna go through um, some slides and if you wanna put your questions in the chat box, I will answer them um, towards the end. So state of Catholic education. So as a reminder, um, the data that I'm going to report on today is reported by schools to diocesan office, then we receive it at NCA. We only receive aggregate data by a diocese. We do not receive any school level data. So that limits um, what I can do my analysis on. And data is collected as of September 10th, 2021. 
Um, so I want to first thank every single person in the diocese, all the schools. I know it's such a huge lift to get us this data every single year. And so we appreciate all the work that you did to air check and get it to us that we can update data to you. So I'm very excited to let you know that after the largest decrease in the last 50 years um, due to the pandemic of 6.4%, this year we have an increase of 3.8%. This is the largest increase we've ever recorded in the 50 years we've been collecting data. And it's also the first increase in 24 years. So it's really great to see that enrollment is up at uh, 1.7 million. If the pandemic hadn't happened, um, we would have expected enrollment to continue on the downward trend of 2.5%. So you can see the dotted line is projected enrollment um, if the pandemic hadn't happened. Um, and we would have been about 1.65 million this year. Um, instead, we're at 1.7 million. So we have about um, 40,000 more students than if the pandemic happened, hadn't happened. So it's great to see that our schools um, met the needs of their community, embraced them, and this allowed them to recruit and retain their students and have um, a higher enrollment than where we would have been if the pandemic hadn't happened. We also had the lowest number of schools closed or merged since um, 2000. We had 71 schools closed or merged this year. Um, you can see this is the last 20 years of enrollment. Last year, we had um, over 200 schools closed. Um, so again, it's great to see that the number of schools closed is down as well as enrollment is up. So what's driving that enrollment increase? Elementary schools had um, a 5.8% increase in enrollment since last year. So this graph is showing the change in enrollment from fall 2018 to fall 2019 <laughs> over here, fall 2019 to fall 2020, and then fall 2020 to fall 2021. Blue is elementary, green is secondary, and gray is total. So you could see um, prior to the pandemic, we were at a two to 3% decrease every year. Um, after the pandemic, elementary schools um, lost 8% of enrollment, while secondary schools lost two and a half percent. And this year, elementary schools are up 5.8%, while secondary schools face a slight decline or relatively state stable. So even though secondary schools didn't increase enrollment, it's so great to see that they didn't have um, a decrease of two and a half percent or more um, like they were on that trend. It's also promising to see that elementary schools are up since um, retention of students in the um, early years is really key to secondary school viability. So as we have um, increase in primary grade levels, um, it's hopefully a good sign for secondary schools. So, What's driving the elementary school enrollment? Pre-kindergarten enrollment. Um, if you recall, pre-kindergarten um, students declined by 27% last year. They went from 169,000 to 122,000. And this year they're back up 34%. They're not at pre-pandemic levels. They're at um, 164 versus 169,000. Um, but it's still great to see that they've rebounded um, compared to the pandemic impact. Across um, every state, we had um, almost every state had an increase in pre-kindergarten enrollment with Utah um, and California showing the most significant increases of 137 and 134% each respectively. So when we look at a diocesan by diocesan level, um, this graph shows the change in enrollment from last year. So, um, on the bottom is the percent change in enrollment, and then the bars is the number of dioceses that had that. So you can see there are six dioceses that had a greater than 15% um, change in enrollment here. 39 had between a three and 5% change in enrollment over here. So 82% of dioceses enrollment increased by 1% or more since last year. So it's promises, promising news all across the country um, with increases. We did have a few um, dioceses that had um, a decrease in enrollment, uh, one had greater than 15% decrease, but most of these are because um, they're small dioceses, so a loss of 10 or 20 students um, causes a greater um, impact on enrollment. And I will um, send out slides to everybody um, after. Now, when we look at the two-year change in enrollment, so as I said, um, we're not back to the levels of 2019-20, um, but we, we are um, closer. Um, it varies widely across the region. 
So this graph is showing the two-year change in enrollment for students and then the two-year change in the number of schools by region. Over here is the graph of the region. Um, so you can see Plains is back to 2019-20 levels. Um, they're the light blue um, states right here. Southeast is also pretty relatively stable, um, which is down here, you know, Florida, Tennessee, Kentucky, where the Mideast um, and the West Far West were impacted most by the pandemic. With the Mideast losing almost 10% of their schools and almost 6% of their students in the last two years. Um, the Mideast is New York, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Delaware, Maryland, um, it's over here. Um, so now when we look at the two-year change in enrollment um, for diocese, um, this is the same graph that I showed you before with the yellow bars is fall 2020 to fall 2021, so the one-year change in enrollment. Gray is the two-year change in enrollment by diocese. So we can see when we look at the one-year change in enrollment, most of the diocese had increases in enrollment. When we look at the two-year change in enrollment, most of the diocese um, still um, had a decrease in enrollment, although 30% of diocese enrollment increased by 1% or more. Um, so you can see we saw um, 30, 30 dioceses had between a 1% and 3% decrease, which matches what we saw a 2.8% decrease um, over the last two years. The largest dioceses um, were impacted the most by the pandemic. They lost enrollment at double the rate than other dioceses in the last two years. Um, so they lost um, five percent of their students over the last two years, while the other 165 dioceses lost two percent of their students. And this is most likely due um, to the population um, shift in the United States as people work from home. They don't need to um, maybe travel into the city, so they're um, moving away from the large cities. So it's worrisome that the largest dioceses may face more school closures and consolidations, and our dioceses will need to determine how they can continue to serve our communities in the cities as these changes occur. And I want to note that prior to the pandemic, this change in enrollment was similar in large for other dioceses. So it isn't something that's been going on that the large dioceses have been um, decreasing at a faster rate than the other dioceses. It um, seems to be due to the pandemic that they've really been impacted. When we look at grade level, um, the two-year change in enrollment, um, I showed you before how pre-kindergarten um, had a decrease in two years, um, but now when we look by grade level, every single grade had a decrease in enrollment except first and second grade from two years ago. Uh, so to me, this is probably the best place for the increase to get happen in first and second grade since we're hoping we can recruit and retain those students um, all the way to 12th grade for the next eight to 12 years. And so we can see increased enrollment, stabilized enrollment, if we can build up those uh, primary grade levels. Sixth to the eighth grade had um, the biggest decrease of 5%. Um, and so I wanted to dig in more to see what was going on there. So NCA collects their data broken out by elementary and middle schools for secondary schools. So elementary and middle schools are the schools serving preschool to eighth grade students. Secondary schools serve sixth to 12th grade students. I will note that the majority of our seventh and eighth grade students are in the elementary schools. We have about 200,000 students in those elementary schools of seventh and eighth grade, and then 20,000 seventh and eighth graders in the secondary school. However, when I looked in um, the two year change, I saw something I thought was interesting is that we've lost um, seventh and eighth grade students um, in the elementary schools of five and a half percent, while the secondary schools increased by 5.4%. So the elementary schools, um, later grades are decreasing while the early grades that secondary schools are serving are increasing. Since we don't have school level data, I can't tell you if these elementary schools are just, elementary school students are just transferring straight to secondary schools or if they're going to public schools or other private schools or charter schools. Um, but I think it's something interesting to know as we're going forward um, what, what this means. Um, we need more research on um, determine what might be the best uh, configuration for in individual elementary and secondary schools um, to be sustainable. And this is definitely gonna be um, depending on the local context of you know, what the other public school grade level configurations are, what the secondary schools are, and how can our elementary and secondary schools work together to create a PK through 12 pipeline in their towns or communities.
Um, I showed this graph last year. Um, but I just wanted to show again the change in um, location of our schools over the last 20 years. So urban and inner city schools have decreased by 36% in the last two decades. Um, when we look at elementary versus secondary schools, um, elementary schools also had a, a rural decrease in the uh, number of schools by 31%, and suburban schools decreased by 17%, where secondary schools have remained relatively stable over um, the last 20 years. And then each sponsorship, whether it's parish, inter-parish, diocesan, or private, and you can see parish schools is this blue line. They've decreased by 43% in the last two decades, um, much more um, significant decrease in the elementary schools. While diocesan schools, which is the gray bar in each of these graphs, they've actually seen an increase um, in elementary schools that increased by 200% in the last uh, 20 years. And we're not sure if these elementary schools that um, these parish elementary schools, they could be possibly closing or they could be just being um, reconfigured as a diocesan school. And that's why we saw the increase. So as governance models change over time, continue to see this um, graph change. Now switch um, to talk about uh, parental school choice programs. So for the first time this year, we've collected um, information on the utilization of parental choice programs across the country. So we know that 33 states in the District of Columbia offer school choice programs, but they vary in terms of their funding. Um, and we also know that the expansion of parental choice programs has long been viewed as a potential solution to increasing challenges of Catholic school viability. But until now, we never knew uh, how many students or schools um, by state, by diocese are utilizing them. So now we know about 7% of Catholic school students and 20% of schools enroll students using parental choice programs with Arizona and Florida having um, the most students and schools. We need to conduct more research um, and looking into the impact of parental choice programs on enrollment. From now what we can see, it looks like it helps um, stabilize enrollment, but probably needs to be with um, other, other enrollment and marketing factors um, to determine how we can uh, stabilize and increase enrollment. Um, when we look at student um, race um, over the last 20 years, um, so white students is in green, it's gone from about 74% to 71%. And multiracial students have seen um, the biggest increase from 1.9% to 7.4%, while the rest kind of remains steady. Hispanic Latino enrollment has increased by almost 5% in the last decade. Um, we have more um, Hispanic Latinos in elementary schools versus secondary schools with 19.2% of um, students in elementary schools being Hispanic this year. And then non-Catholic um, student enrollment has risen. Um, back in 1970, when we first started collecting, it was 2.7%. This year, it's 20.3%. Um, that's up half a percentage point from last year, which is at 19.7%. And then when we look at um, Title I and free and reduced price lunch, um, the percent of students receiving um, Title I services has remained steady, while the percent of students receiving free and re reduced price lunch has increased over time to 12.7%. And the one caveat is this year we asked about students receiving um, free and reduced price lunch first eligible. This 12.7% is both eligible. 15.4% um, of students received it. So a lot of um, states and governments um, gave free lunch to entire schools. And so that's why we see a higher percent of students um, receiving free or reduced price lunch and who are necessarily eligible. And um, this year, for the first time, we looked at participation in federal funds by region. Um, so you could see Title um, II is the most utilized across uh, the country, with uh, the Plains and Southeast um, utilizing it the most. And Great Lakes um, has the lowest utilization across all four federal funds. Um, so this might mean um, diocese and office might want to support um, their schools to really utilize the federal funds to support their schools. 
percent of students with disabilities um, is at 5.6 percent. Um, this showed a slight decrease from last year. We did reword the question, so I'm not sure if that's why we saw the decrease, but um, I would say it remained relatively stable, um, you know, in between five and six percent for the last five years. Um, the percent of students um, with wait lists um, decreased by 2% um, to 37%. And we see more elementary schools have wait lists than secondary schools with 39% of elementary schools. The one caveat is this could be one grade level has a wait list. And so they say they have a wait list. Um, so it's hard to tell what, how, many, how much um, capacity is open or not. And then this year for the first time, we kind of broke out that professional staff. In the past, we just asked about um, total staff, but we wanted to know, you know, how much administrators there are versus aides versus teachers and guidance counselors. And then I just compared it to public schools. The public school data is from um, fall 2019, so it's a little old, but it's interesting to see we have slightly more um, teachers at 76% versus 73% um, in public schools. And we have um, slightly more principals and assistant principals at 6% versus 3% in the public schools and we have less instructional aids. We also calculated principal and teacher retention for the first time this year. Um, and we found that teacher and principal retention um, is slightly higher than public schools, which was really great to see. Um, we wanna note that, you know, this is relatively high amidst the added pressure of the COVID-19 pandemic. And also our teacher pay is on average almost 20% below what local public school districts pay. So Catholic schools need to offer opportunities for professional and spiritual goals for the teachers and diocese and support their principals to continue to retain them um, throughout the future. Some other facts that I thought were um, interesting to note, um, 71 schools um, have IV programs, 114 are dual language immersion programs. There are seven Catholic virtual schools across the country. And we have about 5,000 students um, who are international students with AIDS. Given all this data, um, what are some challenges for our school? As I noted, um, we've seen decreased enrollment in those large cities. So that impact of population shifts in cities. Um, we want to look at new funding and governance models for parish and urban schools, as we've seen over the last 20 years, um, the number of schools that are parish and urban have decreased. Looking at how we can support parental choice across the country, and then we need more disaggregated data so we can talk additional research and answer some of these questions. And that said, there are a lot of opportunities for our schools. Um, we saw increased enrollment in first and second grade over the last two years. So how can we continue to retain those students in early grades to stabilize or increase enrollment? Micro schools um, could be a great possibility for areas that have less students to have um, micro schools, which are schools with less than 150 students. Um, NAEP assessments, we've always done really great. Catholic schools have done great in NAEP assessments. Um, and this year, for those who participate, um, we can look at pre and post pandemic achievement data to see how um, our Catholic schools did um, pre and post pandemic compared to public schools. Parishes need to work with um, the parishioners to emphasize how important um, Catholic schools are and how it's the church issues. Um, we can partner with business and finance leaders to develop new financial models. And then as um, we need to continue to build relationships with local politics to um, utilize federal funds so we can address any learning losses due to the pandemic and support our schools. So I see some questions in the chat box, so I will um, go through them as I can. Um, So we have a note that for the parental choice question, we don't have all the data. Some, di some dioceses and some schools didn't answer that. So that 7% of students that are participating in parental choice programs is a minimum number. I'm sure it, it might be a lot higher. And so we'll continue to collect that data. We do have the data on one year change in enrollment by grade level. Every single grade um, increased enrollment except um, that um, I think it was like ninth grade didn't increase, um, but I'm not sure. We'll post that on our website so you can see it. Um, 
there's going to be a uh, page on our website similar to last year where you can kind of play around with the data and see um, year by year change enrollment. Um, yes, uh, it wasn't for first and second grade are the only grade that saw an increase from two years ago, um, just because we we're looking at pre and post pandemic. We defined disabilities this year as having a disability um, noted by the local public school district before we just said has a disability. So I think that's why there's the disconnect of maybe a decrease in um, the percent of students with disabilities. Um, I'll be meeting with um, diocesan leaders and those responsible for data in March thinking about how we can best um, ask these questions and any questions that we're missing. We do have student teacher ratios for Catholic schools. I don't have the public schools off um, the top of my head, um, but the student teacher ratio for Catholic schools is 11.6 to one. Um, we do have state by state data. Um, I don't have it readily available, um, but we could put it on um, the website. Um, I'm also working on an article with the Manhattan Institute, which will look dig into the two year state by state change in enrollment. Um, the enrollment collection date was always in mid-September. We moved it up one week earlier because we were hoping we would uh, be able to complete this quicker. Um, we still were not able to. Um, we still got to January, um, but we'll keep it in September just because um, it takes so long to collect the data. Um, you can get more info on microschools by reaching out to Jill Annabel, who was um, at the, the start of this presentation, and I put her email in the chat box. So all this information um, is going to be on our website. We already have a data brief um, on our on our website um, with 10, 10 statistics. Um, and that the data brief has been passed on to the media um, and it's on our website and we'll be continuing to update the website as we have um, more information. If there's any other questions, feel free to um, put them in the chat. I think I got all of them. And Sarah put in the chat that public school student to teacher ratio is 15.8 to one. So ours is a lot lower. Yep, we will have the slides available. Um, and the data brief is located on our website here, um, which has some of this data. Um, and we are working on finalizing the report, as Sarah said, it should be available to buy in, um, in uh, March. Teacher salary information, we actually have teacher salary information. Um, it's in our annual financial report, um, which we are working on finalizing and should be available to purchase in March. We have the 2018-19 one available on our website. Um, if you have specific questions while we're waiting for that to be finalized, feel free to reach out to me and I can tell you um, some more, um, some of the answers to that question. I see one question I'm happy to, to take. Um, it's about strategies for retention of the students um, over the next three to five years. Gratefully, we have our Catholic school superintendents gathering monthly for um, time together as a network. And that is a great topic now that everyone's had that data in front of them against their local data to talk about uh, what they have found to be successful with those retention strategies. Um, like Annie said, we're grateful that the data is, is that we have retained students in the early elementary grades, which gives great hope um, for students to stay with us with those with strategies in mind, um, which are always a local consideration. How you retain students from region to region um, varies greatly. And I just put in the chat box the annual financial report, which has teacher salaries. 
Um, we know that teacher salaries are about 20% um, 20 per, 20 less than um, local public school districts. So there's a question about practical recording. Um, all our webinars are located on our website. Um, I think Jill put that link in it. Um, and we will be having a convention, um, which you all should register for. We will be having um, some sessions specifically on um, recruitment and enrollment. Um, we'll have both virtual and in-person sessions on that topic. So I see some other questions in the chat box about um, the greater population and what is the percent of the total population three to 18. Um, I've, I dug into that a little bit. I don't have it readily available. Um, Idaho is actually the state that has the most um, of their total population in Catholic schools, which I thought was interesting. Um, and then there's another question about longitudinal data. Um, we, can, we don't have all that data, unfortunately. Um, and that's why we need all your help when we ask for new questions, um, letting us know how this can help um, your research or any questions you have, um, as well as the school level data. I wanna take a moment to, to thank Annie for all the partnerships she has with those who are conducting research in Catholic higher ed and other institutions. Um, those partnerships allow this data to be used and analyzed and so that the studies that you are suggesting can become um, fully published. And so thank you for all those partnerships you all have created um, so that we can best use this data and analyze it appropriately. Feel free to reach out and have any other questions you have. Um, I put my email in the chat box. Um, we appreciate all that you all do on the ground to support our school, and I hope this data can be helpful to you. Have a great day, everyone.